Okay, let's just start it. Who's ready for homework three? Uh, so yeah. to, today, yeah, woo. Uh, today is the last day of required content for homework three. So after today, you can do all of the objectives. As of last week, you could do objectives one through four. Today, we're wrapping up objective five. Everything's out there on the table. Uh, this homework can get tricky, uh, especially handling the WebSocket frames. That's the bulk of the homework, is uh, handling WebSocket frames. Yeah, tune this down a little. It's handling the WebSocket frames. That's the bulk of the difficulty. So, uh, so it's nice. I like to give you the content up front and give you extra time to work on it. Like you have uh, a full two and a half weeks after receiving all of the content uh, to be able to code this up. So I would recommend not waiting to the last minute. I mean, nobody listens to that advice, though. Um, but if you waited to the last minute with homework two and felt the pain of that and how much you were rushed and everything, uh, it'll be the same thing for homework three. Homeworks two and three are the most difficult of the course. I don't think homework four is all that difficult, and you know homework one wasn't too bad. Um, but homework two and three are, in my opinion, about on the same level of difficulty. And uh, homework four does taper off a little bit in difficulty. I do that on purpose. I like the last homework to, be a, uh, to ease up a little bit. So if homework two and three are kicking, you, uh, kicking your butt, uh, don't worry about homework four being another step up in difficulty. I, in my opinion, and by design, homework four is a step down in difficulty. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but homework three is about the same as homework two, so however much homework two kicked your ass, expect homework three to kick your ass that much uh, as well. Uh, so plan your time accordingly is what I'm saying. Uh, but as of today, you'll have everything you need to do homework three. So with that, let's do it. We introduced WebRTC last time. Now let's talk about all the details. Can someone take notes for me while I do 365? Uh, yeah, I, I took notes for you and posted them on the course website. The yeah, slides are the notes exactly, Tyler. Thank you. I, I, Cole, I, I know it was a joke. I, I'm just playing off the joke. I, I did it in a deadpan way, though. Uh, all right, so let's talk about WebRTC. Uh, So you're only implementing the signaling server. Before we get into details about what all these different servers for WebRTC are, uh, just a reminder that you're only implementing the signaling server uh, on your homework. So when I'm talking about the other two servers, the stun and the turn, those are not servers that you have to implement, so don't panic about all the details with them. Uh, we're learning that just to know exactly how WebRTC works. I'm not asking you to implement all of WebRTC. Details on what to code in this lecture. I'll give you more details next lecture, but this lecture you're going to get all the details uh, as well. So we need to establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection, which gets a little tricky right off the bat. So if I need to, I want to establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection with someone, first I need to know their IP address and port number for which they want to connect with a peer-to-peer -peer agreement. And we need to agree on all the other details. Uh, are we going to share video? Or are we going to share just audio? Are we going to share uh, pictures? Uh, what are we going to share? Is it just a chat connection? Uh, what do we want to communicate over this? Uh, there's a lot of decisions to be made before the connection can be made. So, so what we need is some, uh, some communication between the two clients to negotiate this. And a lot of these are where your server is going to come in, is to facilitate these initial connections. So first, we're going to get a, an offer message, which will contain a few key pieces of information. This ice U frag, which will uniquely identify a user. It's a very important thing. It's a, a kind of strange thing for WebRTC but it's a very important thing to be able to uniquely identify a particular user for the purposes of WebRTC. We're also going to negotiate all that stuff that I just talked about. How are we going to send information? 
Uh, if it's a video, what codecs are we going to use? What frame rate? You know, what, what can I expect? Because once we establish this connection, it's just a whole bunch of bytes, just like anything else, and we need to know how to interpret those bytes, uh, what encodings and, and all that good stuff. Uh, so all of this information is contained in a WebRTC offer. So one client is going to initiate the connection and say, hey, I have a WebRTC offer. I would like to connect to you. Here's my unique ID. Here's all the codecs and stuff uh, information. Uh, I would like to make this connection with you. The other client, if they're willing to accept that uh, RTC connect, WebRTC connection, they're going to respond with an answer, which is going to contain a, a few things, which, uh, containing the same information with the audio and visual stuff, and their unique user identification. Uh, so each user wants to know how to identify the other user. They're both going to get this UFRAG, which is going to be uh, how they'll identify each other. Yeah. So part of the answer is just like opening up the floodgates and starting the stream? After this handshake, so this is like a WebRTC handshake. After this handshake, that stream will be established. What's the data, though? Is that just the type? The data? Yeah, so this is like, I'm going to send you AAC formatted video or something like that. And then I say, I'm going to send you the same video. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, this is the format that I'm going to send you. And then once that's negotiated, then when the stream does start and the bytes do start coming, each side's going to know how to interpret those bytes. They're going to say, okay, you told me you were using this encoding, this bit rate, and all this stuff, um, this frame rate. Uh, then they'll know how to interpret those bytes and actually play the video and audio or in any other information. It doesn't have to be audio and visual, but that's, uh, since that's what we're doing with the homework and that's usually the use case of WebRTC, uh, that's what I'll, I'll say in the slides. So after that point, the users know uh, all about this connection and how they're going to interpret the bytes that they send to each other. But how do they even do that. Uh, how do you just send these messages to another client out there on the internet? Uh, so there's a, a big problem here uh, that we have to solve is how to actually send that information. Namely, like what's that user's IP address, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so with websites, we have a solution to this called DNS. Like we have to get the server's IP address. Like when you go to uh, buffalo.edu, you need buffalo.edu's IP address. Probably none of us in this room know it. I don't know what it is. Um, but we need that IP address to be able to send a request to that website. We need it. It has to happen. That's how the internet works, is off IP addresses. Uh, but we have something called DNS, where we just type in a domain name. We type in buffalo.edu. Our browser sends a request to the DNS server. We have a DNS lookup. That returns the IP address. And then we connect to that IP address. Uh, send a request to that IP address on either port 80 or 443, depending on its, if it's HTTP or HTTPS, respectively. So we have this solved for web servers if we're navigating the internet and connecting to a server, but we need something similar for client connections. With uh, this client-to-client -client connection, we need to do the same thing, but we don't have DNS. There's no DNS lookup where I can just look up uh, you know, a person and get your IP address. That doesn't exist. That wouldn't make sense for it to exist. Uh, and there would be all kinds of privacy issues if that did exist. Like, that's a big problem. So we need to get the IP and port of a particular user. And the problem is that IP address, uh, that port, uh, the IP address and port, actually, both of them, will be very dynamic. Like most times, you're not going to know what your IP address is. You're not going to care either. Um, but also in your browser, if you ever type printed out the client IDs or in lecture when I print out the client IDs, you also see that the port number is going to change all the time too. When you open up a new TCP connection through your browser, your browser is going to pick some random port number um, that's unused and then use that for the TCP connection. Same thing is going to happen with WebRTC. Like you need to use a port that's not already used. Like for example, if we said uh, port, uh, port 9000 is now the WebRTC port. We do this with a lot of protocols, like HTTP is port 80. Uh, 9000 is now the WebRTC port. 
Problem is, what if you want two WebRTC connections simultaneously? What if you want a three-way call? You can't reuse port 9000. So we can't just say this is the WebRTC port. Uh, that's not going to work. So we need to be able to handle any port and any port dynamically and any IP address dynamically. Uh, so this creates quite a bit of issues. Question mark? No question mark. I could have deleted one of those slides. So what we're going to do is communicate through a signaling server. We're not going to solve the IP port issue yet, but to get these initial connections, these initial uh, messages sent, the offer and the accept, we're going to or the offer and answer. We're going to use a signaling server, the one thing that you'll code in your uh, in your homework assignment, the signaling server. But the signaling server, it's got a pretty easy jo uh, job. Once you have everything set up for WebSockets, it's, I'm telling you, Objective Five isn't too hard unless you have a bug in your WebSockets. You're just going to forward these messages. You're going to get a WebRTC offer. You're going to forward it to the other client. You're going to get a WebRTC answer, and you're going to forward it to the other client. You're just a go-between. You're just going to forward the signals from one peer to the other. There's no HTML to escape. There's no modification you need to make to these messages. And you're going to do this over WebSocket, uh, WebSockets. So you get the message. You extract the payload. You remove the masking bytes, flip the masking bit to zero, and reuse everything else with the frame. If you don't want to, you don't even have to recompute payload length, because the payload isn't going to change. You just forward that message to the other person. Uh, that's what your signaling server is doing. So you get this offer, you get an answer, uh, and you can make a, there's a simplifying assumption in your homework, which is why objective, uh, did I say four earlier, well, objective five, why it's so easy, is uh, you can assume that there's only two peers total at all, at any given time. So if you get one of these messages, at that time, it's safe in your code to make the assumption that you have exactly two WebSocket connections. So you look at the connection that sent you that message. You write some code to get the other connection, which you can safely assume in Objective 5 that you only have two connections. You get the other connection and forward it to that connection. So you're just a go-between. You get a message from one client. You send it to the other client with the assumption that there's only two. Of course, this isn't generally true with WebRTC. You could have. Uh, you could have 100 WebSocket connections and get a request from one WebSocket connection that says, I want to connect to that particular person. And then you'd have to add some logic. Um, but I'm not making you do that on, on Objective 5. Yeah? So Peer 1 wants to send an offer to Peer 2 mm -hmm. to the server. How does Peer 1 know where, the, where it's supposed to go without the user? P peer 1 doesn't. So it'll go to the server and say, I would like to connect to this person. And your server needs some logic to decide who that person is. So like if you had authentication that we'll have for homework four, and you have 100 users logged in, and somebody says, I want to connect to this username, you would go to that username, find their WebSocket connection, and send it to them. And then when they respond, you know who sent their request. So then you would re respond back to that person based on the UFRAG, making sure that you send it to the right person. Because you might have 10 people all trying to connect to each other simultaneously. So you look at the UFRAG to figure out who it is and get it to that person. I can absorb the zero on one assignment. It's, it's up to you. I mean, just run the numbers. If, if uh, I, I know it's nothing important. I, I just, my curiosity peaked. Oh, you're talking about a different course. I see. Yeah. Still, same answer. Like, look at the syllabus for that course and decide for yourself. Uh, something, I feel like it's lost on students, but you can do whatever the hell you want. It's all about consequences. If you want to take a zero, just look at the syllabus and see how that's going to affect you. It's a little different for courses with curves, but you don't have to do anything ever. Uh, it's all about consequence. Can you take an F, for example? Maybe that's some, what part of your decision. Yeah. Uh, what was that? Uh, 
if you refresh the page, will there be the video call? Not if you refresh the page, no. Because uh, everything would reset at that point. Because uh, we'll see on Friday, I'll go through the code, but a lot of the code is front end JavaScript, and all those variables will get wiped out. Uh, the variable storing the connection and everything, all that gets wiped out when you refresh. But you, but you can uh, shut down the server, and the connection will persist. After, like, after your signaling server does its thing, it steps out of the picture. There's a true peer to peer connection after that. Uh, so I'll show that on Friday. If I forget again, I forgot on Monday to show it. Uh, but I'll shut down my server, and we'll see that the videos are still going. Uh, so the protocol, the WebRTC protocol, doesn't specify how the signaling server should be implemented. It can be implemented in any way ever. Uh, yeah. Mm -mm. No. Uh, so your signaling server doesn't have to handle disconnections at all. Uh, that is like the only other role of the signaling server. Maybe I should just add that next semester. But, uh, but that's the only other role the signaling server would have, is if one client wants to end the connection, it would go through the signaling server, which doesn't fully make sense to me. Why not just send it over the WebRTC? Oh, actually, that does make sense to me. Because the WebRTC connection itself will be UDP. So you might drop the disconnect message. So you go through the signaling server to make sure that message arrives. Uh, that would be your only other role of the signaling server. So there's no, nothing in the protocol says really anything about the signaling server. It def, the protocol defines the structure of an offer, the structure of an answer. But it doesn't say how to get the, uh, the offer or answer from one client to the other. It just says, usually, you know, you, you should use a signaling server or whatever. But it doesn't say how that signaling server should be implemented. So you could do this through HTTP forms. Well, that would be a little tough, actually, because of the refresh. But you could use AJAX would be, uh, would be like the standard answer. Use AJAX and then maybe uh, polling with AJAX or long polling to send these messages. All you got to do is get the bytes from one person to the other, any way that you can do it. But hey, we got two-way full communication between server and client through WebSockets. That's convenient. Let's just use that. Uh, and a lot of signaling servers do use WebSockets. Just the most convenient answer uh, to be able to handle these messages. Because when you get an offer, you have to have a server push to the other client. Uh, so it's polling, long polling, or uh, WebSockets are the three answers that we know about to be able to do that. WebSockets are the fastest, most efficient, though it does require a persistent connection, but hey, WebSockets are great. So we're going to use WebSockets to handle that. So we'll get a WebSocket frame with the offer, forward a WebSocket frame to the other client, get the answer as a WebSocket frame, and send the answer as a WebSocket frame. So that's the goal of your signaling server, is to forward these messages to the other client, since you can assume there's exactly two connections at this point. When we're testing, we're going to start up your server, create two, exactly two connections, and then run through this. So you can assume that there are exactly two WebSocket connections. You're just forwarding messages from one to the other. Not much, uh, not much else to worry about. Yeah. So two WebSocket connections total. Yep. One yeah, like when, if you get a WebRTC offer, for example, uh, at that point, for this course, for grading homework, objective five, I should say, this isn't general and uh, overall at all, but when we're grading homework, uh, objective five of homework three, there will be exactly two WebSocket connections. So if over one of those connections, if you, or rather, if ever you receive a WebRTC offer, you know that you have exactly two WebSocket connections. One of those connections just sent you a WebRTC offer so the other connection is the person they want to connect to. Uh, just a simplifying assumption we can make for the homework, not true in general at all. It's just an artificial thing to make Objective 5 not crazy hard. And right now, Objective 5 is pretty easy. It's almost trivial. But if I got rid of that assumption, homework 5 would be ridiculously difficult. You'd have to manage all, all your users and have somebody send an offer for a specific username. Uh, it'd get a bit more complex.
Okay, but we still got to solve that. We still got to solve that IP port issue. So the big problem with this IP port issue is that your clients themselves don't know their IP in port. In most cases, uh, this is a big problem. So when you're connected to a network, you're going to have a local IP address and a local port number that you're using that in your browser, your browser said, let me open up a connection on this port and then uh, you know, create that connection from your machine. So your machine, you might be using uh, your local IP address, 192.168.05, and this port 8956. But once that goes to your router, your router is going to change that to a public-facing IP and port. It's going to use your public IP address, which your router uses to connect to the internet. This is going to be the IP address that your uh, ISP provided to you and says, this is your IP address. Internal to your network, you're going to have different IP addresses for each device. But when your network communicates to the outside world, it's using your public IP address. So we get a different IP address and potentially a different port, well, usually a different port, because the router is going to use one of its TCP port connections, because for every device that is connected to this local network, it has to handle all those connections to the outside world. So your router is going to change that port number as well, use one of its port numbers, because, for example, if we have five devices connected uh, to this network, to this router, to this, to this NAT, and... Uh, each one of those, you open up Chrome on each one, and Chrome says, I want port, uh, I want port 30,000, each one of them, each one of those five says, we're going to open port 30,000 to connect to the internet. Uh, that NAT can't use, your router can't use port 30,000 for all five devices, because it only has one port 30,000, so it has to reassign the port number as well. So you don't know your IP address or port when you're connecting to the signaling server. Uh, let's see. So this is a problem because the eventual connection needs to be between this, uh, this client going through their NAT to this NAT to the other client. And neither client knows their public IP or port. It's a problem. This is a problem. I got ahead of my slide there. Yeah. Are we still at the stage where we're sending an offer and answer? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so, so we get the offer and answer. Like, a client sends an offer and gets an answer. Uh, that's cool and all. But after that handshake happens, it's time to open up that UDP connection between the peers. So this client is going to say, hey, you know, for example, if we put the IP and port in the, uh, in the answer, it's going to be this IP and port. And then this machine is going to try to open up a UDP connection to that IP and port. Well, that's a local IP address. So it's going to go to this NAT and bounce back to its local network and look for 052 on its local network and probably not find something or find a machine that's not ready for a WebRTC connection or a UDP connection at all. Uh, it's not going to work for us. Uh, so we need to connect to this IP and port via this IP and port. So each client needs to know the IP and port, the public IP and port of the other client. Can we just talk to the router? Um, no. Uh, the problem with that is what if you have two layers of NATs? How do you even know that the second one exists? But there is a fail-safe way to do this. Oh, my slides. I got way ahead of my slides here. Uh, so this is a problem. For those of you who mess with, I do want to go down this tangent, actually. Uh, those of you who mess around with port forwarding, you're, uh, you're playing a game online that's not going through like, uh, uh, like a server. It's the wrong way. Like you want a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer game. Oh, what am I even... I forget the, the situation, but, uh, but sometimes you need port forwarding for a game. You have a game that's running on a specific port. The game developer said, this is the port that we use for this game. It's peer-to-peer -peer connections, right, when you're not going through a server. Uh, this game runs on this port number. 
uh, and then whenever you connect to somebody else using that game, you connect using that port number. So when you're behind a NAT, and this NAT gets a request on that port number, that NAT doesn't know what to do with it. So with pet port forwarding, you're telling your router, you're saying, hey, if you get anything, any information on this port, forward it to my gaming desktop, please. And then it'll do that for you. It'll forward anything on that port to your gaming, uh, your gaming rig. And that's what you're doing with port forwarding. If you don't do that, your router doesn't know how to route that traffic and you don't get the request. Because if you've got 10 devices connected to your router, how is it going to know what that's for, who that request is for? Port forwarding is the answer there. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah. For the local IP address of NAT, you said it's used for communication on the local network. Is that more sending an iMessage to your brother or more computers in a hospital all updating their charts or both? Um, both well, probably not the iMessage because they would have to go to the cell tower anyway. Uh, but if you're on two... Devices connected, oh, maybe not on Wi-Fi. I don't know exactly how that app works, but uh, internally. Uh, but if you have two machines on the same network and you want to, like just, uh, just yesterday, actually, I mapped a network drive on one machine to the other so I could transfer files real quick through my router. Uh, that would be your local IP address. I had to actually type in 192.168.15 was the, happened to be the IP address for my desktop. That's the local IP address but that had nothing to do with its public IP address. So if right now I wanted to connect to my desktop, that IP address doesn't do anything for me because it's on a different network. I'd have to get the IP address that my ISP assigns to my house and then forward uh, a port to my desktop to be able to connect to it and then uh, go that way. Not necessarily for the map network drive, but in general, I would have to forward the port, tell the router, hey, on this port, talk to my desktop and then I would connect to that port and I would be able to talk to my desktop. So the, the public IP is assigned by the ISP? Yes. Uh, so to answer, to solve this question, we use a STUN server, Session Traversal, Traversal of User Datagram Protocol Server. That doesn't, I, I don't remember the acronym, but is, is that really what it is? User Datagram Protocol? Anyway, STUN server. Uh, so a stun server is a pretty straightforward server. It sits there, and when it gets a request, it just returns your IP and port. Problem solved. So stun server just gets requests, gets these requests, and since it's part of the public internet, it doesn't matter how complex your network architecture is, to get to the stun server, you have to go through the internet at large, so the stun server has access to your public IP and port number that you're connecting to it with. So it's going to be able to return that information. Problem solved. Uh, so in, in Google has public free to use stun servers. So in the JavaScript code that I give you as part of the homework, uh, there's a lot of JavaScript code. So I put it as a separate file. That, and there's a link to it in the handout. Uh, but in that JavaScript code, which I'll go through on Friday, uh, there's this server hard-coded into that JavaScript, and that's going to be the stun server. So in your JavaScript code, when you visit your homework server, it's going to talk to the stun2.1.google.com, port 19302. It's going to say, what's my public IP and port? It's going to say, here's your public IP and port, and then that's it. We got it. Doesn't matter how complex the network is. Uh, any NAT problems, any routers, any craziness going on there, we don't care about any of it. That stun server is going to cut through everything. So each client before, uh, not before, but each client is going to talk to the stun server. They might talk to different stun servers. In our purposes, it'll be the same one because we're using the same JavaScript code. But each client's going to talk to a, a stun server, get their public IP and port, and then send that information through the signaling server with our third type of message. There will be three types of messages that you forward with your signaling server. This, w, or this WebRTC candidate, which will contain, among other pieces of information, this stun server, uh, this public IP and port that we obtained from the stun server. So there's the offer. 
there's the, uh, oh, it should be the next slide. There's the offer, the answer, and as many candidate messages as required to establish this connection. And that's what your signaling server has to do. So we get an offer, we get an answer, yeah, let's connect. And then you get the candidates being sent. And then uh, once they have the suitable candidates, all the candidate lists, they'll connect to one of those candidates and then create the connection. So the, uh, the candidate, this is an actual candidate message. This is going to contain all the information needed to connect to the user. So we're going to see a few key pieces of information, UDP. This is going to be a UDP connection. The public, I, that's not public. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's fine, right? Because uh, I got this by, I don't know if that fully makes sense to me. I'll have to think about that a little bit. Uh, but that's a, that's a local IP address. Um, but since both machines were on my laptop, but the Stun server should have returned a public IP address. I'll have to think about that one. I think I saw this last time I presented the slide and broke down in the middle of the lecture. Like, why is that a local IP address? I'm just, there's a good reason, but I, I, don't, I can't think of it right now. Uh, and port. And then the UFRAG also. So this is a unique name for this particular user. And some other information um, that WebRTC cares about. You might get multiple... Uh, you might get multiple candidates. Uh, I think that's why, because this is like the local candidate and then a public one was sent as well. You might get multiple candidate messages and also a, I think it's just null candidate message, which means this is the end of my candidate list. So when there's multiple candidates, you'll get multiple of these messages and the, uh, the end of candidates message. So if there are multiple candidates, this is usually where, during this whole process really, this is where, so you send the offer and get the answer and then send several candidates. This is usually where you're going to have WebSocket frames that are sent back to back. So when we're talking about reading from the TCP connection one time and getting multiple WebSocket frames or a whole frame and then a partial frame, things like that, this is usually where that's going to happen. Uh, so this is why I say if your WebSocket is uh, connection, all your WebSocket code is really rock solid and robust, then Objective 5 is pretty easy. But if you have that bug where you're reading multiple WebSocket frames at a time and not handling that and just throwing away frames, you might end up throwing away your candidate lists, all your candidate messages, and uh, not be able to process that properly. And then the WebRTC connection just doesn't establish. So those are the things to look out for when creating this WebRTC connection. Oh, yeah, and we call these ICE candidates in the candidate, for what it's worth. And after all that, the signaling server steps out of the way. The sun, stun servers, they've done their job. They just get one request and return one response per user. Uh, all that stuff's done, and they establish a UDP connection and start streaming directly with each other. All the servers are done at that point. It's a true peer-to-peer -peer connection after the signaling server negotiates these, uh, these offers, uh, answers, and the candidates. Peer-to-peer, -peer, true peer-to-peer -peer connection between two users, no servers. So your role is to forward these messages. Whenever you get an offer, an answer, or a candidate, forward it to the other WebSocket connection. Uh, in the JavaScript code that I'll show on Friday, there's a, a format that I use for these where it's a JSON string with a type that's going to say whether it's a WebRTC offer, a WebRTC answer, a WebRTC candidate, or a chat message. Like if it doesn't have type, it's a check, to, uh, or if it's a chat message. So, and then it'll contain the information for whatever one it is. And then when 
the client receives messages of this type, it's expecting the same JSON format. So if you parse it, if you check the JSON and see that it's one of these three, just send it to the other client, untouched. The whole frame, uh, uh, demask it and all that stuff, get rid of the masking key and the masking bit, but just send it to the other client. Yeah? I forgot what WB stands for. WB? WB frame <laughs> That's a typo. Yeah, <laughs> that, sh that should be WS, WebSocket. Yeah. yeah, that's my bad. WB, that's, it's only a one character typo, right? But it's a bad character to have a typo on. <laughs> Completely changes the, the meaning of that. Yeah? So, are, are WebSocket frames sent over? Um, they're still on packages online, but there's just a string of ones and zeros? The, the WebSocket frame? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, they're still sent over IP packets and still using TCP. It's still all the same protocols, but by the time your code gets it, it's just a bunch of ones and zeros. Just like everything, everything over the internet has to be just ones and zeros. Like you still have to re receive the first 1,024 bytes or whatever and mm -hmm. find how many there are and yep. bring them back. Yeah, you're reading from the TCP stream the same exact way, except you're interpreting them as WebSocket frames instead of HTTP messages, HTTP requests. Yeah, WebSocket frame. Uh, but the payload isn't going to change. So, I mean, by this point, you should have all your code that generates the payload links and everything and reads payload links and all that. Uh, so this shouldn't really be a big deal. Um, but if it is for you, if somehow you, you didn't write generic code in the other objectives, you can reuse that uh, payload length. You can't do that with the chat messages. Chat messages do change length for a couple of reasons. Uh, you're adding the username and you're escaping HTML. Uh, so you can't do the same thing with the messages, with the chat messages. Uh, you can't use HTTP with WebRTC. Sorry. Sorry, bro. Can't do it. You have to set up HTTPS. Uh, the lucky thing is there's one exception to this, is when you're using localhost, then it's allowed. So for your testing, for your homework, uh, we can actually use HTTP and it's all fine. You can test locally. We're going to test your code locally. It's all going to be over localhost. So everything's going to be fine with that. Um, but using it across machines, so before we have HTTPS, running your code uh, on the internet at large, this WebRTC code won't work until we get some HTTPS going on in our server, which is homework for stuff. So just, the, just for what it's worth, if you're expecting to connect across devices, uh, even on your local network and typing in the IP address and things like that, um, it's not going to work unless uh, it's the same machine. So just keep that in mind. I had a few students uh, try that. They wanted to use their code, which I hope a lot of you want to, uh, use their code across devices instead of looking at the same camera. Um, it's not going to work if it's not localhost. Uh, the way you can test on multiple cameras is having a webcam and your built-in cam. You can just have different cameras set up, and then you can actually see different things. I should, speaking of, I should do that on Friday. I should bring in a webcam and actually show that it's two different feeds talking to each other. OK, there's one more problem that I didn't talk about yet that I'm going to talk about in the next. Uh, these clocks are always wrong, but uh, less than 11 minutes. So sometimes peer-to-peer -peer connections are just outright banned by your network architecture, your network administrators, or whatever. Um, and that's going to be a problem with WebRTC. Yeah? Do we expect to send a message type? Uh, you're going to send it in exactly the format you get it in. Oh, w yeah, without the mask. The mass bit will be zero, and the four mass bytes will be removed. Other than that, it's identical. Oh, and the payload won't be masked, of course. So sometimes you just can't create a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Your network just blocks it. You got firewalls, you got NATs that, uh, that don't allow it, or dynamic NATs, which keep changing uh, your port, which gets annoying. 
uh, certain reasons why you just won't be able to create a peer-to-peer, -peer, a true peer-to-peer -peer connection. It gets annoying. Uh, so that's where our third type of server comes in, the turn server, which is my, by far the least, my least favorite WebRTC server for, for what it's worth. But uh, anyway, uh, if peer-to-peer -peer connections are blocked, what the turn server does is acts as a relay between two clients. So instead of creating a UDP connection directly between two clients, you both connect a UDP to the turn server, you send, messages, send data to the turn server, and then the turn server forwards it to the other side. Kind of like the role that our signaling server was playing, except for the actual UDP connection itself. The actual WebRTC connection that two peers are connecting to, they're going through a turn server. I think, I, I think this is dumb. <laughs> I, I'm sure there's good reasons for this. I'm sure in practice there's a good logical reason why you would use a turn server. But for my, for my money, like this just completely defeats the purpose of a peer-to-peer -peer connection. You're still relying on a server. Why don't we just use any number of protocols that allow us to do this? Uh, my only guess of why this would happen is if your whole architecture is built on WebRTC. So you still want to use all your WebRTC code but you want to be able to support clients who have these firewall and dynamic NAT issues, then you would say, well, I guess for those people, we'll throw in this turn server. But if you're going to trust a server and have a server do all your work for you, just do anything else. <laughs> like, you don't have to use WebRTC. You didn't have to wait till 2018 for WebRTC to come out uh, if you're going to use a server anyway. It defeats the purpose. But, uh, the one exception to that is if you run your own turn server, but again, if you're setting up your own turn server, you're, you can use anything. You don't have to use WebRTC at that point. You're probably going to set up something fancier, something cooler, whatever your purposes are. You're just going to set up something else. Like if you're going to trust a turn, like just open Zoom, have a Zoom meeting. <laughs> like uh, there's, there's no peer-to-peer -peer anymore. Uh, yeah. So, oh, that's my last slide. So that's all I want to say about turn servers. But that's what uh, turn servers do, would do. So just a reminder, the sig out of the three, you have the stun, the turn, and the signaling. The uh, signaling server is the one that you'll be coding. Anybody have questions? I ran out of slide. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, on the slide, you mentioned port forward, uh, port forwarding. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question was, like, like why, why doesn't it know, I guess? Like, what, what's the difference? Because uh, if somebody connects to your network and your network has 10 devices, which device does the router send that request to? But, okay. It doesn't know. It, it just doesn't know. Wait, but then if, if the problem is, like, you know, translating from router to a specific device, then how come we avoid that problem here? Uh, because we because we get our public port for that device, oh, the the device that that is creating the connection. Like if I create a if I connect to a website and my local port is like thirty thousand, that's what my browser chose. The router knows to send information back over that connection to my device because right. I have that connection open. So I create that connection. I talk to the the stun. That port's already allocated to me. The router already knows to send messages to my device on that port. Right. So it'll be good to go in that sense. So like but with port forwarding, it's when a new connection is established. Like a message just out of nowhere comes in where there's no connection already established. I'm saying forward that messages, those messages to me. Okay, uh, I'm out of slides, and I don't want to go into any code because I'll save that all for Monday. Or Friday, sorry. So have a great day. I'll see you all Friday.